Hi, I'm Danny, one of the TAs from Professor Marr's Constitutional Law class. This week for our interactive segment, I'll be going over some of the questions that are on the discussion forums, not only from our live question and answer session a couple weeks ago, but also from the questions about the individual week's lecture materials that you are posting online. I know I'm speaking for all the TAs when I say we're really uh, appreciating the, all of the questions you guys have been asking, and also all of the deep and specific conversations that have been going on in the discussion forums. Um, we are really impressed by the level of conversations that are going on, and there are a lot of really interesting questions out there. So having said that, let's move on to the first question. That's one from James Raths, who asks, where in the Constitution does it say how the size of the House of Representatives can be changed? Why isn't the House still limited to 65 members? And with that, he's alluding to the size of the House at the time of the ratification of the Constitution. So the size of the House of Representatives is a little bit different than the size of the Senate. Um, Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution specifies that in Clause 3, that representatives shall be, for the House of Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers. This is unlike uh, Article 1, Section 3, which gives a very concrete rule that the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state. So what you see here is that in Article 1, it, the, the size of the House of Representatives is going to be changing over time according to how Congress itself decides it should be apportioned. That means it's done not by constitutional amendment or within the first and original text of the Constitution, but rather by statutes that Congress passes every so often to determine how many representatives there, there will be and how they'll be apportioned among the several states. Now, the Constitution doesn't say any number is okay. It puts both a floor and a ceiling on the number of, of members of the House of Representatives. So as a floor, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 specifies that each state shall have at least one representative. So as of today, there'd have to be at least 50 representatives, although it's a little bit odd to conceive of a House of Representatives that is smaller than the Senate. There's no firm constitutional rule that says the House of Representatives must be larger than the Senate, but there are some clues, both historical and textual, that indicate that it was designed to be the larger of the two houses. For instance, Article 1, Section 2 in the first clause says that the, in order to vote for members of the House of Representatives, electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. That basically means that structurally, the House of Representatives is designed to be analogous to the more democratically elected, more numerous House of the state legislatures too. So the, the floor then is set at one representative per state, although there's a suggestion that it should always be bigger than the Senate. Then there's a ceiling too, saying that the number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000 people in the United States. This though is a pretty big range. Um, you can see that by just looking at the size of the United States today, 50 states, around 300 million people, and that would mean that the size of the House of Representatives could range from 50 representatives to around 10,000 representatives, which is a pretty big margin. Um, and actually, at the time of the founding, a lot of people were concerned with exactly James's question about how, how Congress would apportion the number of people in the House of Representatives and what the number would be. Would it be more like 65 or would it be more like thousands of people? Um, as Professor Amar himself actually wrote uh, on page 78 of America's Constitution of Biography, no aspect of the federal constitution provoked more trenchant criticism than the House size. There were a number of debates um, that anti-federalists had where they were concerned about the small size of the House of Representatives. They were concerned that a smaller House would be more susceptible to bribery and corruption because it would be easier to buy the votes of a smaller number of people than it would be to buy the votes of a larger number of people. They were also just democratically concerned that there wouldn't be enough opportunity for political involvement of people who wanted to run for office if there were fewer offices to have. Um, and there's also a concern just in terms of representational democracy that uh, any one representative who has to represent the interests of more and more people would be less able to represent them well. And one of the reasons you can, one of the ways you can see historically just the depth to which this debate happened is that it wasn't even resolved until the very last day of the Constitutional Convention, at which point George Washington himself intervened. This is pretty remarkable because George Washington had been making a habit of not intervening in substantive debates during the Constitutional Convention, which he presided over, but rather remaining neutral on most of the issues. However, when it came to the size of the House of Representatives, George Washington suggested a change in the maximum number of representatives allowed in order to make the House potentially bigger. So on the very last day, 
they changed the, the maximum rule from one for every 40,000 people to one for every 30,000 people. Now, especially at the time of the founding, when the population of the United States was much smaller, this could actually be a considerable change in the number of representatives allowed. Um, what's also remarkable about this change that George Washington suggested on the very last day is that if you look at the U.S. Constitution itself in the National Archives, you can still see the smudge uh, on the document from where the change was made from 40,000 to 30,000. Um, even with this change, though, people still had concerns. And during ratification debates, uh, all of these concerns about corruption and political participation still raged. And five states, when they ratified the Constitution, specified with appended documents to their ratification vote that they believed the House of Representatives should be larger than just 65, as it was established originally in the Constitution. So uh, by 1793, Congress had responded to these requests or demands, depending on how you characterize them, and increased the House size to around 100. Uh, and the House of Representatives kept increasing with the population of the United States throughout the uh, 19th and 20th centuries and in, until around 1912, when it capped out at 435, which is the size that it's remained to this day. Um, so thanks, James, for that question. Next up, we've got a question from Norm, uh, who asks, why did the Supreme Court not rule the Alien and Sedition Acts unconstitutional immediately? referring to a set of acts passed in the late 18th century, right around the first, uh, the first Congresses that criminalized certain things that we would think would be unconstitutional to criminalize today, such as criticism of the, the government. Now, this is a, a question that has a lot of layers, and one of the first important things to be clear about is that the Supreme Court, under our Constitution's structure, does not issue what are sometimes called advisory opinions, where a court can simply take it upon itself to declare certain things about the law or certain things about the world without parties in front of it. That's because under Article Three of the Constitution, the Supreme Court is only allowed to rule on cases and controversies that are brought before it. So simply put, even if a law may be unconstitutional, the Supreme Court won't declare it that way until parties bring the case before the court. Now, uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts were not actually tested in front of the Supreme Court, although there were numerous other courts that did convict people um, and there were successful cases brought under the Sedition Acts. Um, the other thing to think about in terms of judicial review, which is courts declaring acts, and co acts of Congress unconstitutional, is that it was not as firmly established at the end of the 18th century or beginning of the 19th century as it was today. Um, Today we take it as more of a given that the Supreme Court can hold laws unconstitutional, but around the time of the founding, that was on shakier ground. Um, finally, there's the fact that uh, even if the Supreme Court were to directly consider the constitutionality of the Alien and Sedition Acts at the time that they were passed, the First Amendment was not regularly used to strike down laws uh, that Congress passed until uh, into the 20th century. So even though we today think of the First Amendment as a very powerful tool for courts to use, it took quite some time for it to get that way. One of the interesting things that you can see with the history of the Alien Sedition Acts, though, is the role of other branches beyond the Supreme Court in interpretation of what is and is not constitutional. So for instance, Thomas Jefferson was a vehement critic of the Alien and Sedition Acts. And when he was elected in 1800, he pardoned people who had been prosecuted underneath it, and he also uh, repaid them, reimbursed them for the fines that they had been charged under the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, he also, as all presidents do, uh, had the non-prosecutorial power, which is a fancy way of saying a president can decide not to prosecute someone under a criminal law. So if Congress decides, if Congress passes a law criminalizing certain behavior, and the president views it at that criminalization as unconstitutional, the president doesn't need for the Supreme Court to weigh in on the matter because the president can decide not to bring any charges against people for violating that law. Jefferson did this with the Alien and Sedition Acts. And ultimately, one of the things that the Alien and Sedition Acts also reinforces is the role of the people, people like you and me, in constitutional interpretation through the voting bo box. Um, in the election of 1800, the constitutionality of the Alien and Sedition Acts was a major issue, and Jefferson uh, wrote and spoke about it regularly. It was on people's minds. And, uh, you know, in the election of 1800, we got a new president and a new Congress, and ultimately the Alien and Sedition Acts expired, and the new Congress did not make new ones, and the new president probably would not have signed a new one. Um, so that's one of the ways you can see in which, even if the Supreme Court doesn't hold an act unconstitutional, Congress, the president, and ultimately the voters can decide that certain things are outside of what we want in our constitutional order. So that was a great question, too. 
Finally, uh, we've got a question on secret voting that is appropriately from an, anon an anonymous commenter. Anonymous asks, was there ever any consideration of making all individual congressional votes secret? Congressmen under a secret voting campaign would vote with their hearts rather than along strict party lines. And what's interesting to see about this is that uh, there's actually no constitutional requirement for public voting. Uh, there's no, nothing in the Constitution that mandates that votes in the House or the Senate not be secret. And so it's not just a question of whether there was a historical consideration of whether we can make all individual congressional votes secret, but rather a question that exists to this day. Um, Article 1, Section 5 of the Constitution uh, specifies that each House may determine the rules of its proceedings. In general, the House and the Senate are allowed to determine the rules by which they uh, bring things up for vote, deliberate them on them, and vote on them. Now, there is a specific provision related to secrecy of ballots, which is that in Article 1, Section 5, Clause 3, uh, the yeas and nays of the members of each house on any question shall, at the desire of one-fifth of those present, be entered on the journal. And in the same clause, the Constitution specifies that each house shall keep this journal and shall publish it from time to time. So what this means is basically if one-fifth of the present members of the House of Representatives decide that they want a vote to be made public, the Constitution specifies that it must be so. Um, this isn't to say, though, that all of the other votes must be public or must be private. And uh, like many things in the Constitution, it's not specified firmly, but rather given up to the discretion of the representatives in Congress, and therefore ultimately of the people. So Anonymous suggests that maybe there are reasons we think that secret votes in Congress would be a good thing. And that's a conversation that I encourage you to join on the discussion forums. But the important thing to see is that if it is a good thing, the person to talk up to is your congressman. Um, we don't need a constitutional amendment, we would just need the House itself to change the rules of its proceedings and allow secret votes more often. Thank you, and uh, we look forward to more of these great questions over the coming weeks.